Sunday of Easter. To those who are watching us online or who are watching it later when the weather is not as nice as today, we welcome you too. Also a special welcome this morning to Nathan Reynolds, who's filling in on organ this morning. Good to have you with us today, Nathan, as well. During the, the season of Easter, typically we move from having still not, it's still buzzing. Is it louder buzzing or? But is it louder than before? Sure, I'll come back. We're having some trouble with the hearing devices. Is, is the buzzing louder than it was when you first told me? Oh, I can hear it. Good Lord. I don't know. One was uh, softer and one was... You know what? Dur if you give me that one, during the opening hymn, I'll, I'll do something. I'm not sure what, but I'll do something. Oh, it's always trouble. Something must be off a little bit. Um, as I was saying, during, during um, the season of Easter, it's kind of traditional that we don't do traditional confession and forgiveness. Instead, we begin with a thanksgiving for baptism, kind of hearkening back to the start of Jesus's ministry and also our own baptisms. And while we're talking about Jesus still prepping the disciples to go out and kind of take over for Jesus, it's reminding us that that's our role too now, our responsibility to take that on. So we begin with the thanksgiving of baptism. I invite you to stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the wellspring of grace, our Easter and our joy. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Oh. Immersed in the promises of baptism, let us give thanks for what God has done for us. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your voice thundered over the deep and water became the essence of life. Adam and Eve beheld Eden's verdant rivers. The ark carried your creation through the flood into a new day. Miriam led the dancing as your people passed through the sea into freedom's land. In a desert pool, the Ethiopian official entered your boundless baptismal life. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Alleluia. At the river, your beloved son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you open the floodgates of your reconciling love, freeing us to live as Easter people. We rejoice with glad hearts, giving all honor and praise to you through the risen Christ, our source of living water, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Look, here is water. Here is our water of life. Alleluia. We join in our opening hymn.
thinks he might have found it. So I will speak loudly. Let us pray. Holy and righteous God, you are an author of life, and you adopt us to your children. Fill us with your words of life, that we may live as witnesses to the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. The first reading is from Acts chapter 3. Peter addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord. We will read Psalm 4 responsively by verse. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. You set me free when I was in distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. The Lord will hear me when I call. Offer the appointed sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when grain and wine abound. Our second reading is from 1 John chapter 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Well, as you can tell, we got part of the sound system working. 
the hearing aids we're still working on. I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do you do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy and they, their disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was yet still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. You've heard it from me before about when I read the scriptures, I'm always looking for something. And a lot of times what I'm looking for is any kind of semblance of emotions whatsoever. Today, we have a gospel reading written especially for me because it's loaded with it. The gospel writer seems to use all the words that they can find in this story of Jesus appearing to the disciples. Jesus is trying, to, with, this, with the way he writes this, he's helping us to understand for one of the few times the emotions that are in the room, to try to feel what these overwhelmed disciples are feeling and thinking too. Just in the first three verses of this reading, there's lots of strong and descriptive words like startled and terrified and frightened and doubt, look, touch, see, joy in disbelieving and wondering as well. That's just a bonanza for a reader like me of all kinds of stuff to grab onto. The disciples were afraid and startled and terrified when Jesus appeared to them. I would be too. I would be too. This isn't the first appearance, because remember last week our text readings kind of jumped ahead a little bit. So there was the appearance last week with Thomas, and now this is the second appearance, and they're still terrified, still disbelieving. Even after he shows them the wounds in his hands, his feet, his side, even after that, and I, I think the assumption here is that they were open wounds, that they were still holes in his hands and feet. One might think that the emotion might be pure joy that Jesus has risen, but no, there's disbelieving and wondering. Frankly, as far as wondering goes, I wonder if the joy was kind of underneath all of those other emotions. In other words, it was there, but the predominant emotions were fear and trembling and all of that good stuff. But what about the emotions of Jesus in this room? He's, he's pretty blunt in this reading today. He appears and says, peace be with you. That, that makes sense. They certainly need it. They need to be at peace. 
have you anything here to eat? Just kind of out of nowhere in the text, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. I think that's particularly an important thing for those of us who live in the Midwest and that we're used to Friday night fish fries, that no folks, this was not batter fried fish. This was not anything else. It was broiled fish. Who knows why that was an important thing to say. But it was for some reason that it was broiled fish. Theologian Mark Hoffman, one of my all-time favorites, writes that all of this that was going on here with Jesus, and see the hands, see the feet, see all of that, that this was part of the ghost tests in antiquity. One could check the extremities where bones were evident, namely hands and feet, make sure that a person's feet were on the ground, that's an important test to make sure someone's not a ghost, and that one shows their teeth and that one eats. I found his take really interesting because it adds a new dimension to this story that the disciples really were thinking he was a ghost or at least Jesus was thinking that they're thinking that I'm a ghost. So give me something to eat. That proves it. You've seen my hands, you've seen my feet. I'm not hovering above the ground. I am not a ghost. I am really him. I am, I am Jesus. More than being just a test, though, Jesus did start it with peace be with you when he appeared. And saying, have you something to eat, such a normal thing, that pushes it a little bit further that I am indeed here. You guys are afraid I'm a ghost, and you're anxious and disbelieving, and I'm hungry. Can you give me something to eat? This is, to me, truly the definition of a non-anxious presence. Jesus is the non-anxious presence in the room. Everybody take it easy. I'm human. I'm hungry. I'm the guy you remember. It is me. It's Jesus. Even though the door never opened and I just appeared here in the room, it's still me. It's this whole having a bit of a snack, broiled fish, good for you, it, it's kind of easy to just pass off on that little section as saying, oh, there's nothing to see here, just keep going. That it's just nothing but a little anecdote in the middle of all of this. But also thinking that this appearance is good on its own, that it really doesn't need that. But it really does establish that Jesus has never left them. That they're not alone that he's still present with them and with us as well. It gives us this evidence that often people ask for. Well, prove to me that Jesus died and rose again. It's hard for us to say that. We can say we believe that to be true, but can I prove it to you? Do I have concrete evidence? The only thing that I can point to is this kind of text. And not only did Jesus appear, but Jesus proved to them, at least, that it was him. This line, though, have you anything to eat, has stuck with me this week, I think partially because of piggybacking on last week when we had something similar, something about food. Remember where Jesus just said to the disciples, come and have breakfast very mundane, very normal, very good invitation. And what if all of it is more than meant just to make us chuckle a little bit? Or maybe for us to go, wow, even ghosts eat. <laughs> or Jesus is eating, he's not a ghost. What if there's more to this? What if Jesus is asking for something more 
than a piece of fish to satisfy his hunger? What if there's more intentionality in that question? Do you have anything to eat? What if there's something more there? Let me try to explain what I'm trying to think about and trying to say. If someone that you met was looking for a new church home and in asking you about your church home here at Holy Trinity, what if that person asked you, well, does that place have anything to eat? What would be your first reaction? Well, I'm sure we could find some canned goods or something like that. I mean, frankly, that would be my first reaction because I've had that happen so many times in my career. People coming to the office looking for something to eat, really looking for something to eat, and they knew that we had a cupboard or something like that. Or would, especially if you think back to days past, would you respond in your good, you know, Midwestern way? Well, occasionally we have potlucks, uh, and we do have coffees and cookies after church. That's something to eat. Would you default to that? Or maybe those Wednesday soups and bread suppers that we all love so much. Or would you look at the question the person is asking in a different way? What if it's more than just asking for food for my belly, but I'm looking for something that feeds my soul? What if it was that? Or maybe it's along the line of what can you tell me about Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? Or how does your church serve in our community? How does it bring food to people? Not just bringing food to a pantry or just serving in a, a soup line, but actually being there for people. Long ago in my days of campus ministry, my students and I went to serve in a local food line uh, in La Crosse, Wisconsin. You wouldn't think a city of 50,000 people would need a food line, but there are three of them that have dinner meals, uh, different churches every, day, you know, every week. And so we were standing in line and everybody had smiles on their faces. They were dishing food out on the people's place. And the student standing next to me, Nicole, she was, you know, dishing, looked down, put, put it on the person's plate. And the person whose plate she put it on said, Nicole, is that you? You hear of stories where the person who's serving says to someone in the line, oh, is that you? Because they weren't sure they recognized them, they hadn't seen them in a long time, or they were embarrassed that I, you know, in the food line or what, but this is a person who needs food, a high school classmate of hers. And you could see the spoon in Nicole's hand just shaking because she was being confronted with hunger in a whole new way. Not just a, a nameless face that comes through the line. This is someone she grew up with, someone she went to school with. And, of course, I could tell that she was shook and, and the young woman in line had a baby in one hand, tray in the other, and she said, well, it was good to see you. You know, the pleasantries went by. And everyone kind of embraced Nicole and said, it's okay, it's okay, you know, you're fine. And I stepped in and I took the spoon from her hand and just simply said, go see your friend. Go talk with her. Well, what will we, you, you'll, you'll figure it out. And it was a very, as you can imagine, emotional night for Nicole and for this friend too as they reconnected and talked about life. What do we have to offer? What is the food 
that anyone might expect when they walk through the door, like when you walk into a hamburger restaurant, you expect to have hamburgers and fries. What is it here? What is our hamburger and fries? Is it simply comfort food that we're serving up that just might make me feel better today? Is it food that challenges us, that something is new and different, a different way of, of looking at the text and understanding the words of God? To be certain, the answer is yes to all of the above. Some of us want to be challenged in our understanding of who I am and what is my relationship with Jesus. Some are here for a balm for their wounds and some want more of a study of the text every week. They're all very different hungers and they're all very valid hungers as well. Let me ask you this. So you keep coming back here to this church for worship on Sundays for a reason. What is it? Why is it? Okay, I, I know the first answer. Well, my friends are here. Okay, take the friends one. Set that one off to the side. It's valid. But why else are you here? Why is this important to you? Are you being fed? Are you finding the food that you need for your life? What are you hungry for? You know I like to ask questions. <laughs> That's a lot of them. But I think they're really important questions for us. And while we're at it, Let's work on our menu. Let's work on what it is that we're going to serve here. Let's work on stocking the pantry with food for the soul and food for the bellies. Stock it with food that is for comfort and food that is challenging and food that gives nourishment, food that moves us into the future. Food for those who feel startled and terrified, frightened and doubtful, joyful and disbelieving and wondering. My favorite, <laughs> wondering. Food that is way more than just a snack. Food that really feeds our world. Thanks be to God. Amen. We join in singing our song of the day as we gather at your table. I invite you to stand as you are able.
rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear. Let us pray for the church, for the world, and all those in need of good news. We pray for peace among nations. Especially today, we pray for Israel and Iran. We pray for Palestine and Israel, for Myanmar, Iraq, Haiti, Russia and Ukraine, and South Sudan, God of grace. We pray for victims of gun violence, especially in Minnetonka, Minnesota, Washington, D.C., West Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Chicago, Illinois, God of grace. We pray for safety, protection, and compassion for all refugees, migrants, and those fleeing political violence, God of grace. For areas affected by storms and extreme weather, especially for those recovering from tornadoes and flooding along the Gulf Coast, God of grace. We pray for all in need of your healing touch. Especially today, we pray for those who we name in our hearts now before you. God of grace. It is into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ is with you always. Let us share that peace with one another. You may be seated as we receive our offering and join in singing this joyful Easter tide.
Let us join together in the offering prayer. Risen one, you call us to believe and bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witnesses in the world through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Creator God, you made the wonder that is earth, inscribing soil, sky, and sea with life, energy, and glory. Though we look upon you with eyes dimmed by the fall, you gaze upon us with eyes filled with grace. You breathe new air into our choking lungs. You bring life out of toxic soil. You turn polluted seas into waters of baptism. You parted the waters to liberate your captive people and you rolled away the stone to bring us face to face with your resurrected son. When Jesus came to restore your purpose for the earth, he took the fruit of your abundance and the food of human labor. Come among us now and make us holy in sharing of your gracious abundance in our faltering endeavors. Take these gifts of bread and wine and make them for us the body and blood of your son Jesus, who at supper with the disciples took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper he took a cup of wine, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Ever creating God, Jesus invited his disciples to touch his risen body. Come now in the power of your Holy Spirit and touch all that still need to be resurrected. Teach all who live in fear. Touch anyone who knows daily hunger Touch those who carry wounds and scars. Touch all who are stumbling and tentative in their faith. Touch those who are still wondering. Touch your whole church and make us one in you, that your scars may again proclaim your glory, and we may be united with all of your saints in the coming of your kingdom. Ever one God on earth as in heaven. Amen. The disciple came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he taught them, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all is ready.
Let us pray. Shepherding God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us forth from this banquet to proclaim your goodness and share the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and our friend. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. the God of resurrection power, the Christ of unending joy, and the spirit of Easter hope bless you now and always. Amen. Uh, just two announcements, both of them looking ahead. The first is just a reminder for folks uh, in the Women's Book Club that you meet a week from tomorrow. Uh, in the library at 9.30, and the book is The Art Forger. The second one is an official announcement, and that is an official announcement of a congregational meeting to be held on May 5th following worship. That's the first Sunday in May. And the purpose of this meeting is to approve the ministry site profile which is the document that gets posted on the ELCA's website that shows that we have a vacancy and that this is what our congregation is about. Um, our call committee is meeting again this Tuesday evening to finalize that document. We will have copies for you to pick up after worship next Sunday so that you can review it, underline things, so come to that meeting with questions, with comments, with votes. <laughs> this is a big step. This, we've, we've been through a lot together over the past 18 months, pretty close to that anyway, and this is the big step now where we make it known that we are looking to call a pastor. And you'll see more about that when you read the document. That's all I have for announcements. Our closing hymn today is The Strife is Over, The Battle Won. Um, I think I picked certain verses to do. Did I? I did not. Okay. Oh, that's why, because it's a short one. Sorry, it's actually short verses, so I didn't pick certain verses to do. Anyway, let us stand and join in singing. Alleluia. Go in peace, rejoice, and be glad. Thanks be to God.